Jesus prayed in John 17 that we become one even as he's one with the father and that happened when Jesus died was buried and was raised and gave us the spirit we are one with Christ we are one with God we are one with the spirit he that is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him but the reality of that position in Christ can be experienced in the place of prayer if you don't pray you cannot be able to sense or experience that connection between you and God so prayer is what bonds the believer with God number two we said feeding or feasting on the Word of God being a hardened student of the word is the second way of coming out of spiritual dryness the Bible says in Psalm 1 1 he says blessed is the, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of, of the ungodly nor seated in the seat of the comfort nor standing in the world of sinners the Bible says his delight is in the law of the Lord and this law does he meditate upon during day and night he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters whose leaves shall not wither that's spiritual dryness praise God so the one of God has the potency of bringing the believer out of dryness number three we said fasting we have explained a lot about that reality already number five we said what fellowship and church meetings right all right number six we said what huh you're forgetting last week's teaching i said what follow mm -hmm. learn and pathing after what hungry men so we were saying that we look for hungry men in history and in time and do what they did to arrive at spiritual nourishment praise god the journey you are on right now in your work with god somebody has been on that same journey and even beyond there is nothing new under the sun if today you are praying for 10 hours someone pray for 12 hours if you are praying for 30 hours someone prayed for 40 hours so there is nothing you will do that has not been done you cannot do what has you cannot undo what has been done praise god you you cannot know the bible more than another person i, I mean you you can't it has already been done so just find out how it was done then you pattern your life after it we said a lot one thing i don't want you to forget is that i said every believer who is serious with god must get a library every believer if you are serious with your work with god or serious about your work with god you must get a mini library a shelf where you put some books have some different sessions of books you, you cannot you cannot enter into marriage without understanding marriage praise god you cannot you see you cannot serve god without god so whatever you 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 can do to enhance your spiritual work with god you must do it and one of the things that enhances it is reading many christians are lazy readers they don't like reading though they will exchange movies for reading some will look at the size of the book and say 300 pages forget about it not knowing that there is a way to read you can decide to read three pages of a book every single day if the book is quite small you can read one chapter a day but never end your day without reading a good spiritual book never end your day I have never ended a day without reading a good book no, it has never happened for some times now you must read something to enhance you sharpen yourself the bible says iron sharpens iron you can sharpen yourself with the revelation and knowledge someone had about god amen so we want to go into is it number six right okay a seed way of dealing with spiritual dryness is purity purity i trust god will have enough time to really do justice to this thing purity it, it's unfortunate that many believers have an unbalanced understanding of the message of grace and the love of god we need to understand that 
the grace of God does not contradict the attributes of God very important God is love yet he's just his love doesn't contradict his justice though he loves man he is just in other words sin must be punished when we understand this it, it will clarify so many doubts so the act of jesus dying was not god having pity upon us jesus dying was god punishing us in another person why would a god of love punish us if you don't understand that god is just you won't be able to understand this if god is not just he can't be god so when we walk in the understanding of grace we need to understand that it doesn't contradict god god's attribute god is love and gracious yet he's also holy they don't contradict each other are you following this thing so yesterday i was i was talking to some few people about something that happened on facebook there's someone that wrote probably one of, in one of my articles he wrote and i read that the gospel is not about morality it's all about the grace and the finished work of christ now understand because we've been there before many don't understand this thing now that statement is not fully correct the gospel truly is not is it's not about morality but you have to put it well the gospel is not first of all about morality it is not first of all about what morality as in what you do and what you don't do why because man is spiritually dead he needs life so you don't tell a wee smoker to stop smoking before he gets born again the wee smoker is dead you are a sinner before you sin you don't sin to become a sinner you sin because you are a sinner are you following this thing so you don't tell um, a wee smoker stop smoking before you are before you are saved no 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 he's already dead spiritually don't confuse the fruits of sin and the nature of sin don't confuse the principle of sin from the practice of sin the reason why there's a practice of sin is because there's a principle of sin working in that man he's sinning because he is a sinner so that man does not need to stop sinning he needs to die and he needs to resurrect and that is what jesus did so when a man believes in christ that man becomes a new creature so now the new nature he has came with a certain speck in that speck is love in that speck is holiness in that speck is all the realities and the riches we have in god so now that he's born again he can truly live like christ in the context of that when you say the gospel is not about morality you are right but after the man is born again a guava fruit does not produce mango a, a guava tree does not produce mango fruit so if if he's righteous as he claims there must be an evidence of that righteousness to give validity to that faith which he has are you following this thing so that is what we have the problem about grace in titus chapter 2 from the verse 11 now look what the bible says he says for the grace of god that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men now look the next verse he says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world now follow in the verse 11 he says the grace of god has appeared to all men he didn't say it has appeared to christians but who all men secondly he now says teaching us who is the us believers so he's he's telling us telling us about two works of grace we have the first work of grace and the second work of grace the first work of grace is for salvation of men the second work of grace is for the transformation of men 
so the first thing grace does is to save you justify you redeem you make you a son of god you don't contribute to that there is nobody here who did anything good to be born again you have to believe in jesus christ for by grace are you saved through faith so grace is the hand that gives faith is the hand that takes he says it is not of yourselves it is not of works lest any man should boost so in the first work of grace salvation came to you because you received it by faith but that is not all and this is what the problem is so there are many who say they are saved born again and they are saved only by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone which is true but they remain in that place and that's what a challenge is that's why we have all kinds of christians doing all kinds of things today because they don't understand that the first work of grace is god saving you without your effort you don't have to do anything to become a righteous man you have to believe and receive the gift of righteousness romans 5 17 the bible says as many as receive the gift of righteousness they shall reign in life so you don't do anything in the first work of grace it was purely an act of god you only had to believe but in the second work of grace this time it is not salvation being brought to you the second work of grace is grace now teaches you how to live so the grace that brought you salvation now teaches you how to live so when someone now says that the gospel is not about what you do in this context he is completely in error let your light shine before men that they may see your good works if you're good or what you do doesn't matter how does he say how does he call your good works light are you following this thing so in the first work of grace what came to you salvation in the work, second work of grace what comes to you transformation so it says teaching us that in the verse 12 denying ungodliness look so the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. <laughs> we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where? When we get to heaven? Where? In this present world. Look, look at the next verse. So in the second work of grace if your life after being a christian for a long time is not producing the fruit of righteousness if 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 worldliness is your if your friend the world has become your friend you are unfaithful in your work with god so he says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ look at the next verse he says who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a what a unique people a peculiar people who are what zealous to do what is right so in your journey with god by this time if your zeal is not to do what is right before god you have mesmerized you have missed and you have failed in the grace of god you can fail in the grace of god i'm teaching good here so the challenge we have in the church is that many don't understand the christ as a savior and the christ as a lord so we hear people say i have accepted christ jesus as my lord and my personal savior you didn't understand what he just said jesus is not only a savior please jesus is lord so how does a christian relate to christ as a savior and how does he relate to christ as lord as savior he saves me as lord he runs the affairs of my life 
as savior he brings me redemption as lord i obey him lord means master uh, are you are you following this thing so lord means what master so as savior i receive of his salvation as lord i obey him so if jesus is your savior and is not your lord there is a problem with your christian life if jesus cannot call the shots in your life if the word of god is not something you obey that means you are saying christ i just want you as my savior just deal with my inner death give me life and let me live for myself that's what many christians are saying today you can only be my savior save me that's all i want get me fixed i have a problem i am sick with spiritual death get me saved and god saves you in christ jesus when he's done he says thank you very much for what you've done i really appreciate it it was nice meeting you christ and that's how we're treating jesus we tell him it's nice meeting you we don't know that the man that gave us life is the man we must subject and submit to to receive instructions so after salvation the next thing is discipleship we are followers of him we are obedient to him he's our master he runs the house he calls the shots he has the final say over our lives if you are not at this point you are not growing as a christian i'm teaching good here is someone getting blessed at all so we said the fifth the fifth thing we need to understand about how to deal with spiritual dryness is purity nothing kills revival life in the heart and the life of the believer than sin sin is still a great killer this will help you sin is not there though as many think we need to understand three things about sin I've explained that but I need to keep repeating it so that you get established the key to understanding is repetition you need to understand number one the power of sin number two the penalty of sin and number three the presence of sin follow this carefully when man rebelled against God he became a sinner and he was now a slave to sin he was under the dominion of sin oh wretched man i am who shall deliver me from this body of death man was now a slave to sin sin dominated him so he was under the power of sin number two the wages of sin is death so man not only was under the dominion of sin he was to pay for the penalty and the price for his sin and that penalty is eternal damnation are you following this thing then number three there was the presence of sin which was which was at work in his members in his body they are called passions and lusts inclinations the tendencies to sin they are now in his members so he was under the power of sin he was to face the penalty for sin and the presence of sin was in his members members of his body jesus did something when he died he destroyed the power of sin that's why when a man believes in jesus according to the book of romans chapter 6 if you read that chapter you get to understand that we are free from sin are you following this thing when a man is born again he's freed from the dominion and power of sin look he says for he that is that is freed from sin he's freed from the power and dominion of sin 
so there is no believer who is who is who can be dominated by sin today if you are being dominated by sin it is a choice are you following this thing number two for the wages of sin is dead when christ shed his blood he took your wages and gave you eternal life so christ in his death destroyed the power of sin and in his shedding of blood he paid the price for sin's consequence follow this so he has done two great works for you the third one is what we call what the presence of sin which is where in the members of our body called the flesh unfortunately jesus says i won't do that alone i'm going to hand it over to you so that when you come to me for help i will help you to deal with it so though the believer is free listen though the believer is free from the power of sin and the price of sin has been paid the presence of sin is still present in his member in his members the parts of his body presence of sin is still there you can only be free from the presence of sin when jesus appears that's how come you are born again and yet you are struggling with some things count it not strange so many who are in the grace circle don't understand this reality so they just say it's all about what christ has done what i do doesn't matter hey this is a serious matter here so christ broke the power of sin he paid the price for sin and guess what guess what are you ready for this now you are to fight a holy war to subdue to subject the inclinations and the tendencies of sin which remain in this body you must kill those passions colossians 3 5 says mortify the deeds of the flesh therefore you mortify it that one is not the finished work it's a work that must be finished with you working with the power of the holy ghost i'm teaching good here so after you are born again fighting sin which is the presence of sin which lacks in our members is a holy war please listen to this fighting sin after being born again is a holy war it is not a rest it's a wrestle but the challenge is the good news is that god has given us the armory and the weapons to be able to do it what are the weapons the finished work of christ is the base the foundation and the weapon listen the finished work of christ the realities of the finished work of christ are tools for service they are not toys for playing they are what to know you are righteous by faith in christ is a tool for service to know you have been given access before the father that you can go to the father 24 7 it's a tool for service now that i know i have access and nothing is restricting me i use that tool for prayers are you, are you getting i'm making myself serviceable with the reality of my freedom so our freedom uh, the realities of our redem or the redemptive, redemptive work of christ are tools for service it's not toys for playing there are people who just know they are righteous and they're just playing with it i'm just righteous i'm righteous that's it what are you doing with that reality i'm teaching good here man oh you don't like what i'm saying no so dealing with sin which is present in our members is the holy war it's a fight you can read hebrews chapter 12 from the verse 4 watch out watch out he says ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin this is not talking to an unbeliever so the believer is to strive against sin it's a holy war 
you feel like watching the pornography do you say that i, I have tried so because it's not working the thing overcame me no it's a fight it's a fight listen a believer who is not concerned about sin is a believer who make many mistakes in his life if sinning does not bother you if you're a believer and sinning does not bother you you are okay like it doesn't bother you after you have done something you know it's wrong you keep doing it it doesn't bother you 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 are walking on a very dangerous path and you will live to regret it being sensitive to sin is not weakness it is actually strength when you do something wrong and you are conscious of it lord i'm sorry this this is what i did when you are conscious of that fact it's a sign that you are growing up to be sensitive and conscious you must grieve sin the way it grieves god because sin grieves god though. Ephesians 4 30 he says do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption then the next verse tells us how we grieve the Holy Ghost the next verse says let all bitterness so when a believer walks in bitterness he is grieving the spirit that dwelleth in him you are giving him mental torture he's he's sorrowed inside you he says wrath anger clamor and evil speaking he says let it be divorced be put away with all malice so you can grieve god so anytime you grieve god and you don't feel anything wrong with it please no matter how long you've been a christian you are walking on the wrong path and it will soon find you out i'm teaching good here anybody who truly loves God will not be happy seeing him. It's, it's true. I'm teaching good. Listen. Walking in purity is power. Walking in purity is power. We see that in the New Testament plenty. Let me give you a few. First Timothy chapter 4, the verse 12. Walking in purity is power. Look, he says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation. The word conversation that doesn't mean I'm chatting with you, the word conversation means behavior or manner of life in charity in spirit in faith and in purity so believers are to be examples in purity praise god first timothy chapter 5 the verse 1 rebuke not an elder but entreat him as a father and the younger the younger men as brethren so he says treat the older men as fathers treat the younger men as brethren now when he came to the old women he says treat them as mothers follow are you following this thing when he came to the young sisters he says treat the younger as sisters then put comma with he didn't say purity with what all purity with what when you are dealing with christian sisters as a man listen when i when i'm speaking of purity as a way of dealing with spiritual dryness purity is mainly centered on sexuality so when we are saying be pure it is mainly centered on what sexuality he says you relate with the younger as sisters with what all purity be careful how you chat with that young lady on facebook or okay, on whatsapp who is a christian sister be careful you don't use suggestive words we treat them with all purity if that is not your wife you treat them with purity 
There's a way you hug them. Do you like what I'm saying at all? There are some hugs, by the time you are done, you are done. Oh, I'm teaching good here. With all purity. Today we have all kinds of guys in churches. They propose to this one, they sleep this one, they are done. They move to this one. What, what kind of... Do you know who you... Do you know what you are doing? In the presence of God? You don't fear him. You don't understand this thing. God said that you are the one I'm supposed to marry. <laughs> when you are done, then he said that it was a mistake. The God that spoke to you has now made a mistake. Hey! That's no purity. You don't lead someone on. You lead the person on, son. The person puts the heart inside you now. Then you start backing out. It's a full man or no? No, you are not treating a person with all purity. He says when you are dealing with the Christian sisters, you treat them with what? All oh, purity. This is New Testament. Look, let's go to the next verse. First Timothy chapter 5, the verse 22. Look, he says, Lay hands suddenly on no man neither be partaker of other men's sins then he added keep thyself pure keep yourself pure oh i thought you have been purified by the finished work of jesus that's what you don't understand you've been purified his finished work you purify yourself is an instruction He says, keep yourself one pure as a believer. Maybe you want another verse concerning this particular one. First John chapter 3, the verse 2. Now watch that for yourself. Beloved, now we the sons of God. And it do not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We normally use this for you know revelation to make people happy that they are sons of God. Now are we the sons of God? We will not be the sons of God tomorrow. We will not be the sons of God when we get to heaven. Now are we the sons of God? Lord, you feel that revelation, right, man? It's cool, right, man? Aren't you the son of God, man? Now watch the next verse. Son of God. He says, and every man that had this hope of Jesus returning. <laughs> Am I teaching gospel here? Oh, that man that has the hope that Jesus is re returning. What does he do? You purify yourself even as he is pure. Hayakube kela dimapa. Then we have silence in heaven. <laughs> Praise God. Second Corinthians chapter 7, the verse 1. He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. I wish I have time to let you understand some doctrines and balances. To understand the tenses of salvation when you're reading the new testament you must be careful of tenses you must check out what was written in past tense present tense and future tense when i see a believer who is saying god give me love give me love you don't understand this god does not give you love he helps your love to grow because you already have love romans 5 5 says the love of god has been shed abroad in our hearts so there are tenses in salvation are you following this thing so we have what christ did for us which is not past tense in our reality we have what christ is doing which is the work of the holy ghost in us then we want what christ will do when he appears so if the only revelation you know is what christ has done you make a lot of mistakes i'm teaching good here 
he says let us cleanse ourselves from what all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god that means you cannot live a complete holy life without reverence for god and i've told you that's the ingredient for complete holiness if you want to walk in practical holiness you need the fear of god because if you don't fear god there are some things that will not prick you when you are doing it if you fear god there are some things you never do and i told you the fear of god is not running away from god the fear of god is loving what god loves and hating what he hates the fear of god is having deep respect and honor for god so much so that you begin to give him glory by your life that's the fear of god i can't take a money that does not belong to me because god has not approved it i respect him so much so i can't do it it's the fear of god i'm teaching good first peter chapter 1 verse 15. he says but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation maybe the word conversation that may confuse you give that to me in nlt then you understand what it means so this holiness is not the one you have inwardly which says in ephesians chapter 4 the verse 24 saying that um uh, you, you you've received you god has created in you uh, the new man which is righteous and truly holy that one is different he says but now you must be holy in everything you do just as god who chose you in holy is holy so he says you must be holy what in everything that you do so this is holiness in conduct give me an let's see give me message translation as obedient children okay give that to me in, uh, amplified he says but as the one who called you is holy you yourself also be holy in all your conduct and what manner of living so this one is your life your lifestyle your manner of life must be holy are you following this thing at all hallelujah so now listen if purity is a requirement to deal with spiritual dryness and we said purity is mainly centered on sexuality the main thing that fuels sexuality is lust the main thing that fuels sexuality all all the sexual things that we have today it is stirred up by lust lesbianism gazing bestiality pornography all these things they they are from one root it's called lust lust is a great killer it doesn't care your age it doesn't care it last does not care your position you can be a pastor last does not care you may be a, a 70 year old pastor last does not care it has destroyed many people for many years last is as old as man so last knows you he knows what you like he knows the type of women that you like you didn't like that one you're smiling with me he knows now so last can do proper packaging for you let's continue hallelujah so in first thessalonians chapter 4 the apostle of grace instructs us in fact he commands us first thessalonians chapter 4 from the verse 1 now watch this yourself he says furthermore then we beseech you brethren and exhort you by the lord jesus that as he have received of us how you ought to walk and please god so you would abound more and more okay next verse for ye know what commandments we give you by the lord jesus christ so in the new testament we have commandments from the lord there's not ten commandments so you were you were delivered from ten commandments into the commandment of jesus 
So you are still not free, technically. From the slavery to sin to slavery to Christ. Are you following this thing? For this is the will of God. You want to understand and know the will of God. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification. What is that sanctification? That you abstain from funny what? <laughs> to abstain from fornication is what? The will of God. And the Bible calls it sanctification. So you need to understand sanctification as a person which is Christ in you. First Corinthians 1 30 tells us that he for God, for it is unto him that we are in Christ Jesus, who has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, redemption, and sanctification. So Christ as a person is our sanctification. But in our walk with God, to to abstain from fornication is sanctification. That is sanctification in conduct. When you are putting the sanctification in your heart into practice, it is called fleeing or abstaining from fornication. Now, look at the next verse. He says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. I'm sure you are wondering what vessel is that? Your body. You must, he says, possess it. Gain control over your body. Gain control over your body. <laughs> maybe he didn't get that one give that to me in NLT so that they understand what we're, what we're trying to communicate here he says they need each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor so you control this body you don't let this body control you listen don't be a licentious believer a licentious believer is a believer who does what he wants to do when he feels like doing it that that's not different from an animal yes listen it is a nature of unbelievers that's the nature of unbelievers that's what the bible says give me the next verse then you see look not in the last of concupiscence even as the gentiles which know not god this is a practice of those who don't know god they are the ones who do as they feel and that is an animalistic nature a dog can sleep with another dog in front of you without feeling shy <sighs> so you don't know what you feel like doing the thing i feel like watching pornography i feel like watching the thing i feel like watching the thing boom you're on the internet <laughs> ah! <laughs> let's finish this thing is it going all right first Corinthians chapter 10 give that to me from the verse 3 I was shocked when I saw this scripture quoted by Apostle Paul. He says, and they all did eat the same spiritual meat. Uh huh. Talking of Israel. Okay, I don't have time to read from the verse 1. And they all did drink the same spiritual drink. And they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock, that rock was what? Christ. So he's speaking of what happened in the Old Testament days. Next verse. He says, but with many of these Israelites, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What caused it? Look at the next verse. He says, now these things were our what? examples. There are people who say they don't read Old Testament. The Bible says the things that happened in the Old Testament are for what? An example to the intent that we should not last after evil things as they also lasted. Listen, if you walk in last, you will not last. <laughs> Next verse, let's move on. Watch that. Neither be ye idolaters. I'm sure someone says, I've never gone to a shrine before. Oh, you're a liar. Idolatry in the New Testament is anything you place above God in your heart. If you place your phone above God in your heart, your phone is an idol. If you 
place your girlfriend or your boy in Gandingo Prakastake. Lord, give me grace. Above God in your heart. If you place your husband or your wife above God. If you place your children above God. The reason why I cannot be able to read my Bible is because my children are many. Your child is an idol. I'm teaching good here, man. It's an idol. If you place your friends above God, you answer the phone call to talk to a friend at 8 a.m. for two hours when you have not done your devotion. That friend is an idol. Yeah. That friend is an idol. Some of you, your idols are your clothes. Some your idols are your perfumes. Some your idols are my kubeleke tima ma para. It's in your your iPad. It's in your car. Deal with that idol. It's a distraction. He says these people did the same thing. As were some of them, it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Look, next verse. He says, neither let us commit fornication. As some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. So Apostle Paul is saying, the seriousness of fornication in the old is still serious in the new. Hey! Next verse. Look. He says, neither let us tempt Christ. Do you know a believer can tempt Christ? And some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpent. And look at this final one. He says, neither what? Mama. You know mama? Mama is not mama. As in M-A-M-A. That's not mama here. Mama or to mama, it means to complain. To complain. If you're a believer who complains, God doesn't like it. There are believers who love to complain. They complain about everything. Everything. It's, it's a sin. I'm teaching you. He says, neither mama ye as some also mammoth and were destroyed of the destroyer. That's how serious mammoth is. Some of you be looking at Israel and like, why were they complaining about the, the, the food? When God gave them manna, they said they've eaten manna. So many of you are doing the same thing as a spiritual Israel. Listen. The what Israel did in the old, it has not changed. The church is still doing the same thing. When they entered the promised land, there were other f- nations around them. They went and brought wives from them and they were committing fornication with them. It's still happening in church. They complain, we complain. They lasted, we are lasting. So the spiritual Israel who is preparing for eternity is still repeating the same thing. Look at the next verse. He says, Now all these things happen unto them. For what? An example. That's the example. And they are written for who? For our admonition. You know admonition? It means a rebuke. A warning. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now look. This popular verse. Next verse. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standed take heed lest his fall, lest what he falls. It was from this context. It was from this context. You'll be shocked. The word for there is it's not the kind of fall you are thinking about. The word for there it means to lose authority. That's the, the meaning of the Greek. It also means to no longer have force. Number three, it means, it also means to remove from power. You see why many Christians are not working in authority? You see why many Christians have been, have been removed from force? Why many Christians have been removed from their power? Look, fourthly, it also means to fail in participating in. That's a word for. Finally, it means to miss a share in. I was shocked when I saw this. To miss a share in. You cannot be able to share in the inheritance of God. You cannot walk in it. I, 
am I helping somebody at all? Is this thing getting there? Is it sinking? Colossians 3 5. Look, he says, mortify. Maybe the word is a little confusing, so give that to me in the NLT version. Look, he says, so put to death the sinful earthly things doing what lacking within you listen the fact that you are born again has not many things will not like within you many many things will like within you i was shocked to come to realize that it is even after marriage that your temptation to cheat is even more is higher than when you're not married you don't know that marry and see The temptation is higher when you are married. I'm coming there soon. He says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lacking within you. How did you realize that if you read um, Romans 6, the Bible tells us that we die together with Christ. So we are dead to sin, right? Whoever is dead to sin is free from the power of sin. But now the Bible is telling us to put to death why paul are you confused you said we have died now you are saying we should put to death if you don't understand this trapatite man the man is a spirit he has a soul he lives in a body you will not be able to understand some of these realities what he's telling you to put to death is not your old man that christ has dealt with what he's telling you to put to death is the inclinations of the flesh which remain in your body you have to put it to death don't give it power listen if today you are living in uncontrolled lust which is producing all kinds of things things it means that you have been feeding it there is something you are using to feed that lust because there's a principle in the spirit whatever you feed grows whatever you starve dies it's a principle so if you are realizing that you are in an addiction you're you are not able to come out there is something you are feeding with, with without you knowing that it's being fed because if it is not fed it will die so someone says okay so i've stopped watching the pornography so it must die you are wrong in the kingdom it doesn't work that way when you have stopped that thing you should be doing something else it's called spiritual activity i've had many people come to me say man of god i'm battling with this issue i've been masturbating for about six years seven years eight years now i don't know what to do about it Someone says, man of God, I've not been able to hold myself. I've done all kinds of things with my girlfriend. I don't know what to do. What can I do? Listen. This thing that has been there for about three, four, five years of your life does not take prayer. In the name of Jesus, Father. Bro, rise up. You are free. Six years. One prayer six years then it's gone it's all gone go you are free you don't understand this thing it took six years for you to be in this addiction it will take some time for you to do another spiritual practice to be able to undo the activity listen this kingdom works by energy whatever you energize fully functions if you energize your spiritual life soon that spiritual life will outgrow that fleshly life the bible says walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the last of the flesh if you want to deal with the last of the flesh you don't try to deal with it you rather do the opposite by walking in the spirit you walk in the spirit in order not to fulfill the last of the flesh There was one guy that came i gave him some scriptures and i told him to do some fast so he went on the fast and he said when he came back for the first time about two months it has not happened again then it happened again i said go back to the fast again and when after two months it goes and it comes again go back to the fast again it needs time go back to the fasting and prayer again keep doing it consistently keep growing your spirit 
take every scripture of our last and our walking in what Christ has done. Feed on it, memorize it, quote it. Stop the flesh. Go on three days water fast. Pray in the spirit. Pray in tongues. Pray, just pray. Because Jesus said, pray so that you will not enter into temptation. So the antidote for temptation is prayer. So if that man comes and says, I want to be free. If he does not have a prayer life, it will be difficult for him. So many are trying to be free, yet they don't want to be responsible. That's what we have there. And listen, this thing that we are calling last is not a joke. It is not a joke. I'm telling you, if you don't deal with that last, when you have the chance, as you are listening to this teaching, if you're not getting concerned about that last for practices, which is destroying so many things in your life, and you think you are okay, it, it would it would take so many things from your life. I'm telling you, my wife showed me something. I want to read it to you so you, you realize that this thing we are talking about is not a joke. A woman, I think there was a certain page on Facebook, they call it Tell It Moms. Where mothers share their, their concerns for assistance. I told her to share it with me. So I read it to you guys. And realize that this thing is not a joke. Last, last thing, last. See, if there's one enemy eh, that you should fight in your life, it's last. I know what I'm saying. I fought last. I fought last. I'm telling you. I fought it. Not with my strength, but in the capacity of what Christ has done and in my spiritual disciplines, I dealt with last. And I'm still dealing with it. And I'll, I will deal with it till Jesus comes. Last. My goodness. I, I've told you the other time that there are two brains. One is here and one is in between your thighs. They are, they are all systems. But the unfortunate problem is that they are mutually exclusive. When one is working, one doesn't work. That's why someone who lost women, when he's typing on the computer, this thing is not working. He lost women, but at that time, the thing is not working. Because his brains, everything is connected, concentrating. And when this one too is working, this one has not worked. So you wonder how come such a respectable man can do this it's not respectable man there is something controlling it it's another brain it's another system am i teaching good last does not care whether you are an mp so last to say oh you are an honorable so i'll treat you well this year may not be fine why Last doesn't care. Whether you are president, whether you are youth president, <laughs> it doesn't care. And this will break your heart. You will not be happy about it. But what you are entertaining now will grow to become what I'm about to read to you. I was broken yesterday. I'm telling you. I was just lying on the bed. I didn't know whether to weep. I was like, God, how? The church must hear this thing. Hear it. Hello, Tima. I have been married for 12 years with three kids. Our first girl is 11 years. Second girl is 7 years. Third boy is 3 years. A month ago, my first daughter started bleeding for 2 weeks. Initially, I thought it was her first menstruation, so I didn't pay much attention to it but make sure to guide her until just three days ago she confided in me and told me that her father my husband had sex with her and that resulted into her bleeding but even prior to that she said he has been fingering her a couple of years now 11 year old girl Tima the one that made me weak is that he even fingers a second daughter too and has warned them not to tell anyone or else they would die your own daughter Tima what in God's name will make my husband do that to our girls 
I just couldn't contain my emotions. That moment, I wanted to die. But I waited for my husband to come to return from work and confronted him. Only for him to start crying. And pleading with me to forgive him. But it was the work of the devil. Tima, as I'm writing this, I am so confused. Because my daughters are devastated. I feel I have failed them if I don't take any action against their father. This is beyond me. I don't know if I should forgive him so we can live as a family or report him to the family or to the police. I'm just not myself. Please, what do I do? I lost my appetite yesterday. I am highly sure that they go to church. Highly. I am telling you, this is a man who has been battling with lust since he was young. He didn't deal with it. And unfortunately, money came. There are some of you who are not experiencing lust because you are, you are broke. <laughs> but the thing is there. But he can't live also. The lust is not flourishing. I'm telling you, the, your lust is not flourishing because the pressure does not give erection. The pressure on your head. When the erection comes, it will kill it. He can you how to sponsor the last. It's about near doom, about near doom, about near doom. So some of you, it is, it is poverty that is keeping you holy. <laughs> so stay there. You are free. <laughs> you are free. So you think you are holy? I don't know my answer. I don't know my answer. These people are bad. They are this. On here, Ekulas or Ababum. Amen. Start earning 3,000 galaxies and we'll see. This is real. 11 year old girl, you've been fingering this girl for many years and you started sleeping with your daughter and you are preparing the second born also. Now, look, just look at that. You will say this is inhuman. You will say this is barbaric. You, say, you will say this is animalistic. But I'm telling you, it is last. Last will lure you to do things. After that, it will leave you. Then you face the shame alone. Now, look. Look what he says. He says it's the work of the devil. Now he has, he has blackmailed the woman. Listen, we know the works of the devil. James chapter 1 verse 13. Watch that. We know the works of the devil. Let no man say when he's tempted. Never say it when you are tempted. That I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. Next verse. He says, but every man is tempted. When he is drawn away of his own lust. And what? Enticed. Your own lust. And he's enticed. Next verse. Then, when lust has conceived, look at look at the machinery of lust. When it has conceived, so you can impregnate lust inside you, waiting to explode. He says it bringeth forth sin. So every sin before it happens, lust precedes it. And guess what? Last is selfish. That's what I've always been telling you that every sin stems from selfishness. Today I'm telling you, every sin stems from lust and selfishness. Every sin, it stems from what? Lust and selfishness. Every kind of lust is selfish. It wants what it wants for itself without thinking of the interest of God. Without thinking of the, the shame that God is going to have to his name when you do what you want to do. A man is enticed by his own lust. And when lust has conceived, he brings it forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, when sin is finished with you, it will bring death. That death there is not only physical death. That death there means it will put you in a state where you are separated from God's plan for your life. It's also a kind of death. 
recently had an account from from someone who is very close to me of two christians they were put on a team for evangelism a boy and a girl in fact a man and a woman on evangelism they started the evangelism and they ended the evangelism in the guy's room so the time for evangelism now began to increase now the woman started coming to evangelize in the house and guess what they have a soul the woman is pregnant they have a new soul they have won a soul for Christ you know that you know the problem the woman is seven years older than the guy and now he's supposed to marry the guy by force look at the shame you have brought to the pastor now people will say that this church what is wrong with this church eh? this church look at the kind of people they are producing Meanwhile, look at the kind of teaching we are teaching so you bring shame on on the pastor you bring shame on the pastors and the leaders you bring shame on on other believers do you know when you sin and you bring shame it affects every believer you also bring shame on the universal body of christ because we'll, we will say these are people who are supposed to bring us light look at what they are doing and then ultimately you bring shame on the name of god on the name of god look at such a shame so many of you don't think of all these things you just do what you feel like doing imagine there was one time there was uh, someone who was projecting and was projecting with his laptop he forgot himself he watched pornography that dawn on his laptop he forgot to delete <laughs> it happened in us and the moment he connected the projector the thing came boom you see what last can do last will put you into the thing and come out when you're in trouble then you face the shame again you you face the shame what last does is that it will put you in a place where you can't think i must do it hey i'll do it mm, as if you have, you have smoke we hi Okay. <laughs> 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 the moment you are done then before you realize your eyes are now clear like Adam and Eve no we didn't have to whine say, say, like, uh, <laughs> what have I just done three minutes pleasure can cost you 30 years regret They have a soul. Soul winners. <laughs> I was like, wow. So the church cannot respect each other again. So if a Christian sister says your dress is nice, it means that she likes you. Hey! What's happening in the church? Oh! Hallelujah. One of our pastors here was telling me an account. This is true account. And he was involved in it because he had to go and help with the bail of the person. In his former church where he, he was he was serving, there was one guy that they won in Christ. And he's now with us here. But the guy had become a cell leader, like a pastor there and he's involved in soul winning and mentoring the souls <laughs> mentoring the souls so you do visitations and then you, you study the word of god with the person pray with the person this is not just this is not even three weeks it's not three weeks when a girl got born again he, he started nurturing the girl in christ and the parents came to like him because their daughter has changed so the, the parents anytime we see him they give him reverence and respect one day he went to visit the girl for the normal routine sharing the word of god there was nobody there he forced the lady and slept with the lady this is a lady who is i think less than 17 years old he slept with the girl and told the girl that if he reports to somebody he'll kill her 
that's a pastor or will be a cell leader who's been prepared and the girl reported to the parents he was arrested he was about to be jailed not less than 25 years and it's a They had to go and intervene together with the guy's pastor and everybody. They had to go intervene until the family said they have to redraw it and make it a family issue and deal with it. See, this guy may escape prison, but I'm telling you, he has put someone's daughter in prison. He has put someone's daughter in prison. Look at the man that slept with the 11 year old daughter. How is the family going to be together again? Why are many Christians so selfish? Many fathers, many husbands, many believers so selfish. So that 11 year old girl, she can never forget this experience in her mind. She will never trust any man when she grows. And then the future husband is going to suffer because of what the father has done. Your actions don't only affect you. They affect your children. They affect your friends. They affect your church. They affect your pastor. They affect many people around you. Your unborn generation, 30 years from now, they are going to be affected. They are going to be affected. I speak with so much emotion. They are going to be affected. You must cry to God and tell God, Lord, help me. I don't want to leave a bad legacy for my family. For my children to come and pay a price for my selfishness. Lord, I need help. This is a serious thing now for me now. Listen, you will never be able to be spiritually nourished as long as lust is still lacking in your heart when you have not dealt with it. Don't pretend it's not there and be living life normally. No, no, no. The more you entertain lust, guess what I'm going to tell you? Guess what? The more you entertain lust, the more farther away God will be from your heart. Look what happened to Israel, which is our example. Do you know any time Israel sinned, God gave them over to their enemies? It's a principle for us. Anytime you give in to lust and sin, what happens is that you open a door for the enemy. You open a door for Satan. So giving in to lust and sin is actually a door to propagate the message of the devil. You give the devil more power. You give him power over your life. Look at Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 11, you got to read from the verse one what happened to him such selfishness look he says but king solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of pharaoh women of the moabites ammonites edomites zidionites and hittites look at the kind of women this guy liked next verse of the nations concerning which the lord said unto the children of israel ye shall not go in to them neither shall they come in unto you for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods and solomon clave unto this in love next verse he says and he had 700 wives princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart Remove the wife from there. It's this last that turned away his heart. Next verse. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart. Look at the number of times the Bible is saying it. After Anna God and his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Look at the verse 9. Look, the verse 9. The verse 9. Look he says and the lord was angry with solomon because his heart was turned from the lord god of israel which had appeared to him twice this is someone who had a divine encounter guys the more you entertain this thing i'm talking about 
soon you you, you will soon forget about God it will erase the impact of God upon your heart it will erase it soon God will gradually fade away though it's in you but his influence his awareness his sweet presence it will start fading away And soon it will be very easy for you to deny him. It will be very easy for you to do other things. I wish I had time, but my time is up. I just want you to close your eyes and bow down your head.